DOE CSGF Fellow Andre Salcedo in the field of astronomy at The Ohio State University. Hello everyone, my name is Andre Salcedo. I am a graduate student in the Department of Astronomy at The Ohio State University. I work with my advisor David Weinberg and uh, other collaborators on cosmology and today I'll be telling you about our research into a novel um, combination of data vectors, a novel um, combination of observables for constraining cosmology and what I'll show you is that this combination of observables produces very tight constraints. But before we get to that, I just want to give an overview of cosmology because I know that it's a subject that not everyone is familiar with. Cosmology is the study of the origin and the evolution of the universe. Um, you know, contemporary cosmology has a standard model. Some people call it the concordance model. And what you need to know about it for this talk is that it tells us that the universe is flat, expanding, and it has three major constituents. And those constituents are baryonic matter. That's the kind of matter that we're made out of stars, galaxies, etc. Dark matter, this is another type of matter that does not interact with light, it only interacts gravitationally, which means that we can't observe it directly. And then dark energy, which is the least well understood of the three, it's an unknown form of energy that we think is powering the expansion of the universe on large scales. Now I included a couple uh, panels of a plot, um, let's just focus on the top one. This is showing you the breakdown of the different constituents of the present day. You can see that the universe is dominated by dark energy. About 70% of the matter energy budget is, a form, is in the form of dark energy. The remaining roughly 30% is in the form of some type of matter, but what you, sh what you can see is that about 80% of that remaining 30% is in the form of dark matter. So dark matter dominates the matter distribution of the universe. Now let's look at what that distribution looks like. What we see here is a slice from a dark matter only simulation. So this is a simulation of, of a universe with some cosmology. And I wanna draw you to a couple uh, features of this plot. So first you can see that there's this bar that says 125 megaparsecs for scale. That's about 500 million light years. So we're dealing with very, very large um, scales here. Cosmology deals with huge, massive uh, scales. Okay. And the second thing I wanna draw your attention to it's just the overall structure of the matter density field. Uh, it kind of looks like a web. People call it the cosmic web. You know, it's made up of nodes, filaments, and voids in between. Um, and this structure formed gravitationally, and therefore it remembers, it has some memory of its initial conditions and the cosmological parameters um, that of the universe, right, that formed this, this structure. Now, we can't actually observe this structure, and even if we could, can't observe it directly, and if we could, we'd want to condense it down into more, um, you know, more easily to use mathematical quantities. Now, I think that um, you know, power spectrum come up in a lot of uh, a lot of physical context in physics. In cosmology, we look at a power spectra of the matter density field. So you can think of a power spectrum as kind of a second moment of a density field. Um, in cosmology, it's very common that, for people to define this dimensionless power spectrum. And once you have that, you can compute what, are called the ampl what is called the amplitude of matter fluctuations on some scale. So that's what this second equation is. You can see that it is a convolution of the power spectrum and some window, or sorry, some window function, in this case, a top hat. And the reason that I put this here, and the reason that it's important, is because this equation is used to define one of the parameters that we're most interested in called sigma eight. And that comes from putting eight megaparsecs into this uh, argument. And you get this quantity sigma eight. And you can see that it came from a convolution over the power spectrum. Basically, it's telling you something about the normalization of the power spectrum. It's proportional to how much structure is there in the universe. Now, the next uh, slide of sort of mathematical quantities that we'll look at has to do with correlation functions. Correlation functions are very frequently used as cosmological observables, and our analysis is no exception. We use correlation functions. And um, what a correlation function is, is, you know, well, they have many uh, equivalent definitions, but you can think, first of all, of them as you know, a Fourier transform of a power spectrum, or perhaps you can think of it as a second moment of a density field, right? Now, it's a result of cosmology that the matter-matter correlation function is proportional to the square of sigma eight. So this is why we're so interested in the sigma eight thing, because it's proportional to the matter clustering, to the amount of structure there is. Now, 
we know that the density field is dominated by the dark matter. So that means we can't actually observe it directly, which means we have to use what are called tracers. And here, this final equation just shows you how we actually use these tracers. We select tracers that we think trace the dark matter density field. Um, in this case, we have a bunch of tracers A and B. They could, A and B could be equal to each other, but let's, in full generality, A and B. And so since they're tracers, you can see that the correlation function of A and B is proportional to the correlation function of the matter, of the matter, but there are some extra details that you have to model in the form of these bias factors. So the bias factor of A and the bias factor of B basically tell you about the relationship between the matter and that tracer density field, either A and B respectively. So that's the whole game is, uh, is picking these tracers that are sensitive to cosmology and then being able to accurately model their relationship with the underlying matter density field. So here I'll give you a very concrete example. On the left-hand side, you see another slice of a dark matter only simulation. And on the right-hand slide, what we're seeing is a bunch of simulated galaxies. Now, these simulated galaxies were produced by someone taking a model of the connection between galaxies and the dark matter, applying it to your dark matter simulation on the left, and now we have this simulated set of galaxies, which we can compare to galaxies that we actually see in the real universe. And what I would like to draw your attention to is the fact that galaxies are indeed a pretty good tracer of dark matter in the sense that, you know, any, just about any feature that you see on the left-hand side, you can, you can uh, see is reproduced on the right-hand side. So there's this big overdensity top left. On the left-hand side, it's reproduced on the right-hand panel. So what I want you to take away from this is that visible galaxies trace the underlying dark matter distribution, density distribution, which is invisible. And that's why we need to use tracers. Now, we do use galaxies in our analysis, but we also use clusters of galaxies. If you remember that cosmic web having uh, nodes and voids and filaments, well, clusters of galaxies sit at the top of those nodes. They're, they sit in the largest bound structures, the highest density peaks in the density field, and therefore they're extremely sensitive to cosmology, and that's why we want to use them. Now, what this picture shows is a, uh, a picture of an actual, um, actual galaxy cluster in the real universe. This is Abel 370. And I just want to draw your attention to a couple features here as well. So first is that you have this, the center of the cluster is this big, massive red galaxy. You have a bunch of members. Now, not every galaxy here is a member. There are uh, sort of interlopers from either in front or behind the cluster along the line of sight. But there are ways to determine membership. Uh, we won't go into that. And then the other thing I want to draw your attention to is that these distortions, these streaks of galaxies, there's one here and there's another there. You can, you can see a bunch of them, right? Now, what this is caused by is gravitational lensing. It's a result of general relativity. What it says is that light can be bent by matter. Now, we don't actually utilize effects this extreme. We utilize a much more subtle type of an effect called weak lensing, which refers to the subtle distortions of uh, galaxies, background galaxies, distorted tangential to the radius of the cluster. Now, we can't actually see it in this picture, and you can't really, it's not that useful on an individual cluster basis, but what you can do is you can statistically get a sample of clusters and stack them and use those statistics to measure these subtle distortions. And because the distortions are caused by the matter, that means that when you measure them, you can get a measurement of the internal uh, dark matter profile of the, or the, the cluster of galaxies. And if you look at large scales, you can measure the correlation between the cluster and the matter density field. And you can also measure the mass of the cluster, which is very important. Okay, so clusters are very po uh, powerful probes of cosmology. Unfortunately, there's a catch. And that catch is that with all the sensitivity that they bring, they also bring a bunch of modeling requirements. And the most important is that you have to model and be able to marginalize over what's called the cluster mass observable relation. And I'll explain, with this, I'll explain what that is with the help of this diagram. On the left-hand side, you see this number density is a function of true mass. Now, you want to use, you want to get your cluster sample. You want to get it, you want to select a cluster, cluster sample. You select in a mass, which is a good way to select it because cosmology tells you all kinds of things about what the properties are of uh, clusters of a certain mass, right? Well, the issue is that you can't actually measure the true mass. So you have to make use of some kind of mass proxy. Now, this is generalizable to really any mass proxy. 
it's just something that you know is in some relationship, some fairly tight relationship with the mass. But, you know, you have to actually be able to um, marginalize over this tight, the tightness of this relationship, the scatter in this relationship. So you can imagine that if instead of uh, thresholding based on the true mass, you instead threshold on the mass proxy, you can get a slightly different sample of clusters. And the reason that that's an issue is because then when you go to um, compute some, you know, some general cluster observable, when you do it with a sample that's selected by the true mass, you get a certain answer. And when you do it by a sample that's selected by the mass proxy, you get an answer that's biased relative to the truth. So when you're using clusters, you have to be able to marginalize and model robustly this mass observable relation. And in our case, most importantly, the scatter between the mass proxy and the true mass. So before I go on to the next uh, part of this uh, talk, I just want to take a pause to go over some of the terms that I'm going to be using. So we've seen sigma eight already. That's this uh, parameter that tells you how much matter structure there is. Omega m is another cosmological parameter. This tells you what the density of matter there, there is in the universe. And then sigma log mc is a parameter that we've defined as the scatter, the log normal scatter in that mass observable relation. So when it's higher, there's more scatter. When it's lower, there's less scatter. And the effect of sigma log MC on some of our observables is similar to that of sigma eight or omega, omega M. And that's why we need to find a particular combination that can either break this degeneracy or constrain sigma log MC very well. Okay, and that combination we believe is this. So what we have here is three, uh, three observable quantities that are proportional to correlation functions that we discussed already. And these correlation functions are themselves proportional to three unknowns, sigma eight, the cosmology parameter that we're most interested in, and then two bias factors. The cluster bias encapsulates the information about the cluster mass observer relation. The galaxy bias encapsulates the information about the galaxy, um, the relationship between the underlying matter distribution and the galaxies. And so, you know, it's actually quite simple. You can see that uh, at least at large scales where this, where this relationship applies, you got three unknowns, you got three observables, you can come up with an arithmetic combination of the three that gets you out any one of these things on its own. And so that's at least one idea, one way of thinking about why this is a powerful combination of observables. Okay, so in the interest of time, I won't be able to talk about all the steps that go into the analysis, but I'll just flash this, uh, this uh, flow chart, basically, of the analysis pipeline. And I'll just say a couple of things. Um, the first is that basically at every step in this analysis, there is a lot of computing that's necessary. Fortunately, in many cases, that computation is, um, is uh, trivially parallelized, right? So we're dealing with a lot of embarrassingly parallel tasks. And then um, the other thing I want to emphasize is that the analysis we're doing is a forecast. So we have to model the clusters in the galaxies. We have to model the sensitivity of the observables to the parameters. We have to model their errors, which is quite non-trivial. And then when that's all done, we can produce a likelihood um, and get a forecasted constraint under some assumptions of an of a experiment, right? And that's what I show here. Now, we've, we've assumed a survey similar to the dark energy survey, which is ongoing right now. And what we found is that we get fairly tight constraints on cosmology and the cluster mass observer relation. Now, there's a lot of parameters here that we won't talk about because we don't have time, but let's just look at the two most important, sigma log MC, the scatter that I referred to before, and sigma eight, um, the amount of matter, matter structure. Now you can see that we haven't actually broken the degeneracy. Um, I, what I mean by that is that this uh, ellipse has a tilt, right? So there's still strong degeneracy, but what we have done is we've just constrained the, the scatter in the mass observer relation to a, a tight enough uh, constraint, 12.5%, that we can just let, we actually are able to leverage all the information we have on cosmology. So we haven't broken the degeneracy, but we've produced a tight constraint on the mass observable relation simultaneously with a very tight constraint on sigma eight. 1.5% is quite um, competitive. Now, this, uh, this Venn diagram is just another way of understanding what's going on and why, why these three observables together make such a good constraint. Um, this is totally complementary to the, the uh, three observable, three unknown sort of picture. Now, we have three observables. 
basically each one of them is bringing something to the table, an ingredient to the table that we need. The galaxy-galaxy autocorrelation is very good at constraining the relationship between the galaxies and the matter, but it's not as good at, at constraining either any of the other two. I, it has no information on the clusters and it's not that uh, sensitive to cosmology. The cluster-galaxy cross-correlation actually has information on everything, but on its own, because of, a because of the degeneracy between the galaxies and the clusters, it doesn't actually produce a good constraint, but when you combine it with the galaxy autocorrelation function, you can really leverage a, uh, its information on the cluster mass observer relation. And then finally, the lensing just is very sensitive to cosmology, but it suffers from this degeneracy. But when you, when you uh, combine it with the other two, it has what it needs to really leverage its information on the cosmology. So I just wanna emphasize that no pairwise combination of the three is actually that effective. You really need all three of them. Each one of them has a unique ingredient to uh, bring to the table. And when you combine them all, you get a very tight constraint on cosmology. And you can kind of see how, just how competitive it is in this plot. What this plot shows is um, constraints on sigma eight and omega m from previous studies compared to our forecasted constraint, which I plotted here as this uh, point with the error bars. So you can see that, you know, uh, we're, we're doing maybe about a factor or two better in sigma eight and a little less, not quite as much of an improvement in omega m, but our constraint is quite uh, competitive with what has come before in the literature. And so with that, I just want to end by acknowledging some people. Um, so first, I just want to say that my advisor, David Weinberg, has been a great advisor. And of course, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without his help. Um, I want to give a shout out to the Ohio State uh, Astronomy Department. It's a really great place to work, um, really supportive environment, and I've really enjoyed my time there. And then, of course, I have to acknowledge the Department of Energy. Um, I'm really grateful and thankful for the opportunity that this opportunities that this fellowship has, has given me. And uh, one particular opportunity is my time at my practicum in Argonne National Laboratory. And although I wasn't able to talk about the research I did there, I wouldn't want to give this talk without acknowledging the people I worked with there, like Salman Habib and Lindsey Bleen. So with that, I'll take any questions and thank you.